You might remember BBC Dad, which is how Professor Robert Kelly became known after his live interview was brutally interrupted by his two children in an unprecedented public display of the perils of working from home. His interview occurred in 2017, when working from home was nowhere as common as it became a few years later. The video went viral, and an interesting thing happened. Millions of people found it amusing, not embarrassing. The images traveled the world, and the professor and his family became famous overnight. What's more, they brought to awareness the distinction between personal space and office space. In my opinion, this event marked a turning point in work-from-home etiquette. Domestic disruptions, though not desirable, became acceptable. They can even be used to add some humor and unwind meetings. Today, some people bring their kids to video conferences on purpose. The key to understanding teleconferencing etiquette in a remote work context is to acknowledge that it aims to replace face-to-face -face communication. Zoom, one of the leading teleconferencing platforms, saw an increase of 500% in user traffic when the COVID-19 pandemic hit in 2020. Even in a hybrid environment, most meetings are being held via teleconferencing software. Most calendars now allow you to check the availability of coworkers, so you can send meeting invitations when you know people will be available. When you are invited to a meeting, always RSVP, so that the other participants can schedule the topics around your availability. For conference calls, which are voice-only interactions over a phone or a conferencing system, the rules are pretty simple, and they also apply to the other two forms of teleconferencing, namely video conferencing and web-based conferencing. A conference call requires focused attention. In a remote environment, that means it always needs to be scheduled in advance, to allow participants to manage their work environment and avoid any potential noise or interruptions. Telling 20 people they need to jump on a call in 5 minutes is just asking for trouble. The distractions associated with working from a personal space are very real and need to be considered when small or large groups of people get together to discuss business-related issues. On the flip side, if you are afforded enough time to prepare, you should use it to minimize distractions and the risk of interruptions. Maybe you like to work on your tasks from the yard or the balcony. That's not an appropriate environment for taking a conference call, given that you have no control over noise. Or maybe uh, you have your kids with you in your living room while you work, in which case you should consider moving to a different room, provided, of course, that your kids still have proper supervision. Just like with in-person meetings, conference calls should always have a clear agenda. This will allow everyone who is invited to the call to determine what topics are of interest and whether or not they need to attend. Time is also an important consideration. As opposed to an in-person meeting, there's no physical location you need to get to, so being late to a conference call isn't acceptable from an etiquette standpoint. The same logic dictates that you need to stick to the initially scheduled time and not cause um, conference calls to run over. This can only be done as an exception, when you need to reach a critical decision or work through an important issue. And you must always get the confirmation of all participants that they can extend their stay on the call for a clearly defined period. If there are any persons on the call whom you haven't officially met, you should introduce yourself at the very beginning. What's more, you should always say your name before speaking, as other participants may not recognize your voice. In fact, I've attended multiple conference calls where the wrong person was admonished for something they never said. You can never control your environment completely. So, noise can become a distraction during a conference call. Whether it's your children testing their new drum set, your cat knocking over a vase, or your neighbor's remodeling initiative, the only thing you can do to prevent them from interrupting your call is to place yourself on mute when you're not talking. This will undoubtedly lead you to forgetting to unmute yourself at some point during the call, but it's a much easier issue to deal with than any of the disruptions that we just mentioned. Okay, let's now build on this set of rules for conference calls by including the visual element. Video conferences are the closest thing to a face-to-face -face interaction between remote workers, and they add the all-important nonverbal component to communication. However, a lot of studies show that it does come with uh, added stress and fatigue. A Stanford University study identified four primary reasons why video calls cause fatigue. Firstly, there is an extended and unnatural amount of indirect eye contact. When talking to participants on a video conference, you're advised to look into the camera, which creates the sensation of eye contact. Um, but in a face-to-face -face setting, 
the people direct their attention to whomever is speaking. On a video conference, everyone is looking at everyone else. Even if you're not a speaker, you get the same amount of attention and implicitly the same level of stress. Furthermore, most video conference participants share close-ups of their faces that are unnatural and invasive, creating the type of discomfort associated with someone entering your personal space. Secondly, seeing yourself constantly in real time is energy draining. When we see our reflection in the mirror, we tend to be more critical of ourselves. If your video conferencing system comes with an option to disable your own camera view, you should use it. Next, video conference calls reduce our ability to move. We're constrained by the limits of the video frame, so we can get up and walk around, things that are quite normal during a face-to-face -face meeting. Finally, the non-verbal aspect causes higher cognitive load when we're on a video call. Processing nonverbal communication happens unconsciously in a face-to-face -face setting, but it requires intentional cognitive effort if you're on a video call. Now, all of this considered, the clear takeaway is that not every interaction has to be a video conference. Since video conferences are taxing and even a bit invasive, the polite thing to do is to only use this communication method when there's a real added benefit, such as when you need to leverage the power of a team or a group to solve a problem, or when you need to discuss a sensitive topic. Some companies and managers, mainly those new to remote work, will feel like they must check in to see if their teams are actually working at their desks, so they use video conferences as a way to check in on their team members. Based on everything we know about video conferencing and how it causes fatigue, we can say that such a practice is counterproductive. There's dedicated software for monitoring your team's activity if you need to use it. On the other end of the spectrum, we have meetings that are hijacked by people's need for live human interaction, where time is wasted on small talk and idle gossip without any consideration for the meeting agenda. This type of interaction is important in a remote environment as it replaces the famed and much missed water cooler talk. However, it should not eat into your productive time. It's best to set time aside specifically for socialization calls. If there's a key takeaway from all of this, is that when it comes to video conferences, less is more. When you do have to jump on a video conference, these are the things to look out for. First, your general appearance sends an important nonverbal message. When you're speaking to someone for the first time, it also sets the stage for the first impression, which is more important than you may think, as it influences people's attitude towards you. Make sure you are well-groomed and your face looks just as it would when you have an in-person meeting. In other words, put your best face on display. Also, dress like you would for the office. It's your call if you want to take the chance and wear your gym shorts with your shirt or blazer, uh, but it's risky. You may need to get up from your desk and then your picture could become yet another work-from-home meme. But what good is it to put on your best face and dress for the office if nobody can see that? Make sure your face is properly lit. Either sitting opposite a window or by using artificial lighting should do that. Do your best to raise your webcam at eye level so you look directly into the camera and not downwards. Taking a video conference call from your mobile phone is almost always a bad idea. Another good way of helping people focus on your face is not giving them anything to focus on in the background. The best way you can do that is by ensuring there isn't any movement back there. So, your fish tank, your hamster cage or a kitchen where other members of your household make their way every five minutes are not the best options. Even static elements such as an open bathroom door, an unmade bed or your child's pile of stuffed animals can be distracting. Keep it as simple and clean as possible. Remember, you want other call participants to focus on you. Some people go above and beyond in getting their background to look interesting, showcasing elaborate interior design decisions or an impressive library. In fact, I remember reading that used book sales reached new peaks during the COVID-19 pandemic. And what's most interesting is that people were picking up books based on the color of their covers or jackets rather than by their content. The fact is that your background doesn't make you seem smarter or more interesting during a conference call. It's what you say and how you say it that matters. If you can't accommodate any of these suggestions, then 
and only then you can use the built-in background blurring or replacement option many conferencing systems now come with. Having an unnatural background can be distracting, as can having half your face disappear while you're speaking. Because, you know, this technology isn't quite at the point where you can get away with replacing your background and pretending to be somewhere else. Last but not least, make sure you sound good so that other people can make out what you're saying without any effort. Many studies point to audio quality being more important than the image in a video. The average duration of a video call is around 45 minutes. If you know you're going to be spending much of your time talking, consider using a dedicated headset, purpose-built for conference calls. Your laptop's built-in microphone will almost never live up to the task, as it will pick up echo and background noise, both of which interfere with getting your message across. Also, earbuds and over-ear headphones that come with a microphone aren't usually a good option. A lot of people turn to them for convenience, but the microphones on these things were designed for quick phone calls, not for 30-minute presentations. The main problem is that they also pick up a lot of background noise and your voice doesn't come across as clearly as it would if you were using a dedicated headset. Remember, etiquette is about being polite and you can safely assume it's impolite to deplete a colleague's attentional capacity by making it difficult for them to hear you. After covering the basic rules for conference calls and video conferences, we should address the web-based conferences or those that revolve around screen sharing. Ideally, you'd be running on a dual monitor setup when you know you have to share your screen often. That way you can keep one of your screens clean and free from any sort of digital clutter. The wallpaper choice is also important. Pick something neutral and undistracting. A photo of your family is lovely, but it's inappropriate to share in a business environment. The same goes for references to your favorite movie, sports team, or what have you. None of these belong on a screen that will be shared with colleagues or customers. If you're in the habit of keeping confidential information on your desktop, such as passwords or on a digital post-it note, you should reconsider that choice for a lot of different reasons, but especially if you are at risk of exposing confidential information during a web-based conference. Also, disable any pop-up notifications for email or instant messaging when you're sharing your screen. You never know who might message you and what about. Finally, make sure that your Zoom level allows other participants to the web-based conference to properly see the content you're sharing. Don't assume that everyone's watching the call uh, on a 32-inch 4K monitor. This covers everything you need to know about teleconferencing etiquette. As a parting thought, I want to add a small but significant item to take into consideration. Don't mention where you're working from. Unless you're asked, of course. While some people working remotely are free of any responsibilities and can log into conference calls from exotic beaches, others must work through the sound of their furniture being destroyed by overactive children while laundry and dishes pile up to the sky. It's not polite to brag about what benefits you get out of working remotely because they're not the same for everyone. Just something to keep in mind.